always been, been uh, concerned uh, from a very young age with uh, gender issues, uh, gender equality and equity, and uh, gender recognition. Uh, gender justice is something that my sisters and brothers and I learned from my parents. And um, we also uh, learned them from my maternal grandparents, my mother's uh, mother and father, about the importance of uh, women understanding their own place in this world and seizing the moment to stand and um, firmly on the ground in order to uh, claim their role as contributors to life in, in, at, at equity with, with men. I remember that even wh my father was one of the first people um, to be seen as sending um, girls uh, to school. And uh, in those days, and I'm talking about the um, you know, 1940s and 50s, uh, it was quite natural for a family to decide to send a, a boy um, to school and leave a girl at home, especially when there were fees issues and you couldn't afford to pay for all of them. Uh, my parents made it very clear that there is no differentiation between boys and girls. And we were taught this right from home, right from the chores that we were doing. In the same way, and I'm really grateful for this, my parents taught us not to have class arrogance. They were very, very rich, very rich in their own time. In fact, my father was the one person who had a car in the late uh, 1940s to, be, to go and collect Mze Jomo Kenyatta when he was in our area doing rallies. At that time, my father was working with Kau, and he had, you know, this car that I guess traveled even 10 mph and so on. Uh, those old cars of the time, he would go collect Mze Jomo Kenyatta, bring him uh, home and so forth. And I know that many, many times um, during those rallies, my father used to make it clear, you know, girls, you can come to the rally, boys, you can come to the rallies. But in terms of class, as I say, we had very wealthy parents, but we were taught to always use our hands. We were not allowed to call workers, and there were many of them. I think my parents had as many as 15 full-time workers on their farm, on the land. We were not allowed to go and send them here and there. We were not allowed to ask the workers who are in the house to wash our clothes. We were made to wash our uniform and to iron it. When it was planting time, we were made to go to the shamba and do the work. We were made to go to, um, you know, during harvest and do it. And I remember at the time we used to backbite our parents and see what's wrong with them? What's the point of people being so rich and making us work like this, like everybody else? We really would talk about them with so much resentment and so on. But I am so so grateful for that training because there is nothing I cannot do in terms of, you know, working in the gardens and knowing what crops to put in or not. At Syracuse, I continued the pattern of gardening and so on. We were taught not to despise the people around us in the village. The elders, we were taught, you know, um, to speak to them as fathers, as uncles, you know, using the gikoyo, you know, kind of notion that if someone who is my age mate has a mother, I shouldn't, you know, I should refer to her as mother so and so, or just call her mother full stop. We were taught the um, ancient habits that if it's a rainy day and there is dew on the road and the road is narrow and an elder is passing by, we stand by the side and let the elder pass and greet them. So we, we, were, we came from a, a very well-educated family uh, both on my mother's side and on my father's side in terms of uh, political power because his father was a uh, senior chief, Yedai, and before that, Giti. So um, we came from, you know, this piece of, you know, the, the rulers uh, around the area. My gr paternal grandfather was known to be someone who used to ride a horse all the way up to um, Karatina, inspecting, you know, his area of whatever. But we were taught no arrogance, 
everybody is the same as the other person. Treat them with respect. There is nothing beneath you in terms of the work you can do or what you cannot do. Um, you do not um, boast over what um, uh, luck you have had to have education. You embrace it humbly. We were taught that humility is actually very, very important. We were taught uh, principles of integrity. We were taught never to be intimidated by anybody on account of gender, on account of whatever. We were taught that even if elders actually overstep their limit and abuse us and so on, we had a right to go and um, report it to other elders. But we were also taught, you know, just these spaces of talking back, you don't call out immediately and have an exchange with elders. So we are very, very lucky. And I'm p part of that family of being number three that learned that wealth of indigenous ethos and behavior and so on, as well as uh, the new behavior. So we grew up in a home where my father would call us regularly to ask us how we did in school and how we were performing and so forth. And then he would end up saying, good, 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 good. And ironically said, those here are my boys. <laughs> we, were, we were girls and he wanted us to perform well and he wanted us to identify as girls. But then when he was congratulating us on our performance, we, had, we were boys. We had done well. But you understand the contradictions. Now, you ask me, um, what can a person who hasn't had the kind of privilege that I have had learning, you know, to understand and be proud of the agenda and so on, um, you know, how, how do we unlearn this? Because it, it's not, um, I, I, I don't want to make it personal, let me now speak about it as a general problem. And I think um, the, the problem, Mualim um, uh, Derito, is that it's not the kind of challenge that can be tackled by one family. It's not the kind of challenge that can be tackled by women alone. It's a societal challenge that we need to address. It will begin at home, and it's very important that it begins at home. So we no longer hear that a woman is being sent out of marriage because she has not given birth to a boy child. It will begin at home where the worth of a baby girl is exactly the same worth of a baby boy. And in this, I'm really proud of our new Kenyan constitution because one of the patriarchal ways of entrenching men and power was ownership, ownership of land, for instance, in a family, so that even if you have a family with eight daughters and so on, the land would be left to the one man if there was one man in the family. Now, according to the Kenyan constitution, women have got as much equal rights to land as possible. So it's beginning to emerge. You know, that's at the, at the home center and how we allocate wealth and how we um, you know, recognize people. Um, and it is there in a lot of other societies. We know societies in which, in fact, girls' children are aborted you know, because they are not wanted. It is there in the very language we speak and the associations we make of, of it, you know, making it look as if women are useless and they are cowards. So you tell your boy child, no, 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 men don't cry. Don't cry, you know, only women, women cry. Women are foolish or whatever. Now, when we tell our, our boy children First of all, don't cry. What are we telling them? Because men should have feelings, you know, and, 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 and they should cry the same way as, you know, a, a, a girl child. What are we then telling them when we double that up and say it's girls who cry, as if girls are cowards? And I've written about this a great deal, showing that with all the evidence in front of us of the work that the women do, of the hurdles in life they have to overcome, of the responsibilities they bear at home sometimes when they are, you know, um, left aside. In some polygamous systems where literally women, and women have to fend, you know, for their own group of children and so on, and learn to work with the other women, um, you know, because the man is just the lord and the boss and so on. What are we teaching through language that seems to know, that, that seems to say boys are either more brainy 
or more courageous or more worthy than girls. So we have to look at our language, and this is a collective duty. And language has been with us since times immemorial. So we have to have courage to change it, you know, and update it and let us let it speak of new truths of justice here. So you have that then at the family level, extended family level and so forth. And I could extend it in terms of marriage and how it's assumed that when a woman is married, she becomes the pro property of you know the male that she has married. And um, in some cases, it becomes so complicated if anything ever went wrong for her to reclaim her children and so on. We have to work on those customs. As Cabra said, customs can be enslaving. So if there are indigenous customs that are enslaving us, we have to have the courage to send them away and evolve a new culture that is liberating to all of us. And he was very clear, I was, was Samora Michelle, that if women are not at the forefront or together, you know, with the men in the liberation of our countries and so on, you cannot liberate a country. They went even further. And Michelle used to say, there is no develop, development and there can be no development without women. So all that is very, very important. But in finishing, how do we tackle these issues? We tackle these issues through using um, the definition of feminism that uh, uh, Rhoda Redock has. And, and there are many uh, definitions of feminism, but this one is useful. And she argues that really scared as people are by this title or by this label feminism, it's a very embracing and important and liberating um, you know, title to both men and women because all it means is being aware of the structures and systems of injustice that hold women back, that oppress women. You have to know those systems, whether they are religion, whether they are education, whether they are culture, whether they are traditional, whatever. You have to understand what are the systems that create, you know, this philosophy, this idea, this ethos in life. Once you know them, you can begin tackling them because you can then challenge them. Secondly, she argues that once you have identified structures of, of oppression and so on and begin dismantling them, the main thing here is to be an actor, to be an agent. Being an agent means you cannot leave the situation as it is. Once you have criticized it, identified it, known it, named it, you have then the responsibility to do something about it. And the only thing you can do is either forget it or ignore it or enter and change. Or I guess there is a third one, condone it. Just pretend you're not seeing it. So that third stage then, of agents who are going to act to ensure women are not oppressed because they are part of society, a major part of society, actually involves men and women and youth and children. And I don't see how anybody can be against it. That's all that feminism means. So that I found very liberating, understanding, you know, those structures of oppression and where they come from, you know, the namings of this world that come through language, that come through what we reinforce at home by customs, what sometimes we justify by saying, this is our culture, and this is where Kabura says, if this is our culture and it is offensive, let's get through, let's get rid of it, because we want a culture that speaks to our humanity and humanizes it. So, Dirango, I've been, since a child, I really have been taught these issues of gender, and I affirm them. My maternal grandmother was amazingly strong lady, and she supported those values. And for her, I know it used to be a very, very big challenge because they were challenging their men, their husbands, and so on. If churches are being patriarchal, refusing to give women voices and places of authority, subjugating them and so forth, and mosques are doing the same, and religions are doing the same, we need to challenge them and ask which God, which maker, which loving almighty really likes to see discrimination between their children and why we have created those differences as, you know, women and as men. The other thing I want to say is this, and it's very, very important that we don't see men 
as the enemies of women or feminism. That's why I'm emphasizing structures, institutions, and beliefs. You know why? Because some of the worst patriarchs and defenders of patriarchy can be women. You can hear women articulating this, and sometimes even at weddings you hear it, telling women how to subjugate themselves and be obedient and go crawling. And even if you are beaten, you know, don't shout too loudly for the neighbors to hear you are being beaten. You are spoiling the name of your husband. Can you imagine being drummed by somebody? <laughs> so, I mean, really, you know, it, it, it's a big issue. And what we need is education, education. You know, we need to actually keep naming these sites. And we are doing very well doing that, by the way, because they are, we have women, lawyer organization, we have men, um, uh, you know, working, you know, in civic education. We have very progressive, um, you know, clergy these days, you know, um, articulating the same thing. So uh, my final uh, point is, it, it's not something that we can do and finish in one day. We have to understand it as a revolution, because where changes fail to come after independence or after what, it is assuming that once the celebration of the milestone of independence or whatever has arrived, we are done. No, the struggle continues, as we used to say in the 60s, a luta continua, as we used to say in the 70s. It goes on, and this revolution of changing mentality about women has gone to, got to be ongoing and forever. In fact, ironically, some of the worst sites in terms of, you know, uh, respecting women, um, highly industrialized nations. See the battle right now in the US uh, with Hillary Clinton. Some of it and her rejection are based on very, very clear gender discriminatory grounds. There is absolutely no doubt about it. If Hillary Clinton had gone around saying she could stand in the middle of New York and shoot um, a whole po 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 a lot of people and get away with it, you would never have heard the end of it. If Hillary Clinton had stood up and started imitating a disabled a, 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 a journalist with disability and doing it with the mouth and the hands as that gesture you know, um, Trump was doing it, you would never have heard the end of it. If Hillary Clinton had said, a woman was looking so angry with, with me as a journalist when she was interviewing me, I could see blood in her eyes and I could see blood coming from wherever, you never hear the end of it. But Trump is saying the craziest things, locking people out, locking people with Islam about, deporting them, building a war. If Hillary Clinton was doing this, I'm telling you, she would be scoring something in the 20s and 30s. But he's getting away with it. Males up to today can get away with a great deal. The same way as whites, because of the over the years and centuries or has been created of the privilege of whiteness can get away with anything. So women have to be struggling harder than ever and never continue the battle finish. And any of us women who are in a domestic space where we have managed to liberate ourselves, don't think we are liberated until all other women folk are, liber folk are liberated. It's a collective societal duty. It goes on. So I, I, I know you said, um, you know, and you're right that um, when you, if you mention my name, you would not call me a gender scholar right away. But a lot of people do. And for those who don't, you know, I hope they see a little bit of this, your interview. I hope they read more, as you are saying, about my works. Because from the earliest of ages, my works have been on this. From the creation of the character of woman in the trial of dead and Kimathi co-authored with Ngogi, and the way we have treated, treated that woman, you know, um, uh, with my co-author Ngogi, it, it, it's there. These are debates we have had from time ago. I've been involved in the women's movement from any, every, uh, any year I can remember. When I was at the University of Nairobi, I, I used never to miss meetings, building up to the 10th decade of, you know, uh, women that resulted in the huge conference later on in Beijing. I was very much part of those organizations. Today, I continue to be, it's like a, a bug, and I can't get away with it.